Fantastic. Hello, everybody, and welcome to another edition of the Leading Your International Schools podcast. My name is Barry Cooper. Uh, I'm a regular, semi-regular host, and here with me today is Al Kingsley, who for some won't need any introduction, but for others, Al's going to give him a, a brief pressy of your ridiculous experience. I mean, there's there's 30 years there that's just amazing. So, Al, can you tell us a little bit about what you've been doing recently and, and how you've got to this point? Thank you, Barry. Appreciate that that very brief synopsis. People, whenever they talk about a lot of experience, it's, it's the kind of a, an alternative way of saying he's an old git. But um, <laughs> I, I will try and expand beyond that. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I try and kind of say I'm a man of two hats. That probably doesn't really define it. So in the commercial world, 30 years plus, 35 years, EdTech CEO focusing around developing technology that's right for the education landscape. Um, but in parallel to that, education is very much my passion. So last 20 plus years, I have roles in schools. I'm chair of a multi-academy trust here in the UK, an alternative provision. Um, I sit on the regional schools directors board for the East of England supporting academies and their development across the region. I chair of SEND board. Um, as we've discussed a few times, you know, I've chosen to take some of my musings, simplify them and, and get them authored into kind of my way of having a, a fireside chat about key topics. And I guess around that, now that I've been doing it a while and started to get the hang of the EdTech space, um, I spend a lot of my time traveling around, sharing ideas, experiences, and at the same time, we're all lifelong learners. So the more you share, the more people you meet, you tend to learn new stuff as well. Absolutely. I, I couldn't agree more. And um, there's I love the fireside chat idea, the the John Cap books. I know I know I've got one of yours in the office at work and it's it's great. These small ideas, punchy kind of there so you can digest them in in one or, or two sittings if you're not interrupted by the by the students. Um, I, I mean, we're going to talk about digital strategy today, which I think is, is it, it, everyone in education is talking about this. Everyone in education is thinking about this because uh, technology moves at this exponential rate. And we're always wondering, OK, how can we make the most of it for the kids uh, at our, you know, in our in our schools? Mm. I think for me, though, the first question is when we talk about a digital strategy, what does that actually mean? I want to start from the, the the bottom up and then kind of build this into a conversation. Yeah, there's there's lots of layers. And the truth of it is when I start and often go and do some insight with schools and I kind of say, so what does a digital strategy mean to you? There's normally two halves of the room. There's one half of the room that says it's about a chance to innovate, an opportunity to use new technology. And the other half of the room is frankly a little bit of panic. That sounds a bit scary. That's not in my wheelhouse. Not really sure about that. But fundamentally, a digital strategy is looking as a school, a mat, a district, a independent school group, doesn't matter where you are in the world, frankly. It's about saying, what are we trying to achieve over the next few years? And what role does digital have in actually enabling or facilitating us in getting there? And I suppose we can kind of use the rather, the rather lazy examples that for many years, digital has been something that's been a catalyst for discussion when there's some budget left over and it's how many more devices do we need? What apps do we need? What infrastructure has got really old and creaky that we need to replace? And I try and put the analysis when I'm sitting down with um, school leaders and kind of say, look, I could give you 50 pounds, dollars, whatever your, your, your currency of choice is for, for fuel in your car. And you could head off in any direction and probably arrive somewhere that was quite interesting for a day out. But wouldn't it be better to know what your ultimate destination is so that when you head out with that 50 pounds worth of fuel, you can at least be moving in the right direction. So the subsequent 50 pounds of fuel that you add into the tank each time continue on the journey to the ultimate endpoint. And so in many regards, digital strategy is, is forcing you to look to the long term. What are we trying to achieve? And like many questions in education, there's the what are we trying to achieve? How are we going to achieve it? And the most important question as part of your strategy is why? Why are we doing it? And, and I think those things are the key questions we ask. Down the line, we might get onto the how the hell do we measure it? But actually, we start with the those kind of core questions. I think I think that's an amazing synopsis, and it 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 leads me on to kind of the next kind of I mean, wondering as a as a you know. 23 years in the classroom and yeah, I'm a school principal but I'm still teaching because I love it it's great um, but the when you start that that the building of a strategy 
what do you start with? What's that first point? Is it is it looking at teaching? Is it looking at so is it looking at an end direction for the school? Do you take a top level approach and what's the strategic aim of a school? Or is it simply going into the classroom and seeing, you know, what the what the people at the coalface who are teaching day after day what they what they're needing? Which end do you come at it from? Well, the truth is lots of people approach it from different ends, but the ones that are most successful, I use a Venn diagram because I like drawing pretty pictures. And that for me is the easiest way of explaining it. Ultimately, your digital strategy at the heart needs to be, it's all about co-production, needs to be the feedback from teachers and students. And depending on the age group of your students, potentially parents too. But it's talking about what are the barriers to teaching and learning? What are the things that we could do that would either innovate learning uh, stimulate disengaged learners, make the life of teachers easier, make them more productive, make it easier for them to share feedback with parents or get parents engaged in a child's learning journey. And then around it, you've got all the different stakeholders that need to be part of that co-production. So naturally, you're going to have your senior leadership team who are going to be thinking about the school's development plan, the priorities for the next 12 months. Maybe there's an area where we know that the school is in a, in a, you know, on a bit of a journey of improvement, and that will then prioritise perhaps where digital might unlock some support in that area. You'll have your IT network manager and team who will want to be part of the conversation to ensure that if we have huge aspirations, we're not, first of all, saying, well, that's great, but we haven't got the infrastructure in place to support those aspirations. You've got your data privacy considerations. The more we add technology, access to great learning resources online, we want to make sure that we're not putting our, our students' information and staff information into platforms where there may be risks. We want to try and always be thinking about equity within our schools. So we need to be thinking about our SCND learners, accessibility and tools, because ironically, sometimes we can add great new technology to teaching and learning. And rather than it leveling the playing field, it can create a bigger learning divide because it's not accessible to some children, whether that's cost, ability to use, and so on. We've got safeguarding considerations. You know, if we're going to have our children utilizing all these online activities and resources, are we happy they're safe spaces? Are we able to monitor and keep them safe in those resources? We're going to have some governance oversight. So at some point in our school, we want some challenge why are we doing this? How much is it going to cost? What's it going to do? And an important point on that one is actually the first part of a digital strategy tends to be something that educators are very good at, which is reflective practice. What have we already got and how well is it working? And more often than not, actually, that first process ends up saving you money. Most schools will have multiple curriculum resources in a subject that they've subscribed to each year. Some have become redundant or replaced. Or they'll have IT that's used twice a week that could be better off deployed somewhere else in the school. So you look on the areas where it already works. Then you've got finance. And much to my analogy of earlier, finance dictates the speed of the journey, not the direction of travel. And then all the way around that, you've got how does that weave into our continuous professional development? The key being the continuous. So not two hours at the start of the academic year. But if we want people to use technology, it's fundamentally linked to confidence. Now, you might start a project in any shape, whether it's technology or anything else you do in your school, by saying, if people understand the why, why are we doing this? What's its intent? How are we going to measure it? They're much more likely to get engaged in the project anyway. They're not going to be brought along kicking and screaming. But when it comes to technology, in every school, there will be a complete cross-spectrum of teachers and teaching assistants whose confidence levels with technology will be very, very different. And so in that sense, if we want teachers to either start the academic year and have a new trolley of devices wheeled into their classroom uh, and expect them to weave that effectively into teaching and learning, we've got to find ways to actually build their confidence. And so that continues professional development. And we can talk about all the different ways you can find out about technology, build your confidence is kind of key. So all those come together in my virtual Venn diagram and says, well, we know all the different stakeholders' perspectives. We know we want to try and unlock some teaching and learning. We know we've got some key areas of development in our school or our school in a broader sense. Now let's have a look at what elements of technology would allow us or empower us to move that, that particular challenge forward quickly and most effectively. And then the, the other part of that is then actually... Um, from somebody who's a huge fan of ed tech when used for the right reasons, sometimes less is more. It's often a kind of a knee jerk, which is, 
well, we need that and we need that and we need that and we need that. And the schools around the corner have got this, that and the other. It's not a race. There's no measure that says the more tech you've got, the better you are. It's better to do a few things well, embed them, get evidence of impact, and then you build confidence. And if you've got confidence, you can go again with another layer on top subsequently. I want to I want to go down the confidence rabbit hole. I think this is you know, having you know worked in schools for the last twenty three years. For me, my my impression has always been whenever I've come up to new technology, I've usually just kind of run away. I, I'll be honest with you, it's because it's scary <laughs> and because it's I'm not sure if I can use it in a class effectively because I haven't got the time to practice with it. And more and more as I've got older and I've got you know come into my you know grown into my profession i suppose i'm much happier to get used to to tech to try it first time to learn with the kids to get them kind of playing with it get them helping get them working with me uh, but that's just me how how do we you know att attack that confidence problem in a, in a school how do you get people on site feeling happy from the old stages who would much rather still be using yep. chalk to to the youngsters who've just come out of um of doing their pgce or their training and are you know faced with this massive array of different opportunities for technology ironically and i don't mean it flippantly um it's a problem that as educators fairly well equipped when it comes to how do we get a child who doesn't have confidence in a topic on board and yet we seem to forget all the rules when it comes to how do we get an adult or ourselves we're always very Position good at heal thyself isn't it yeah no, yeah absolutely so i mean i i quite like the um i'm a big fan of sylvia duckworth she does some great sketch notes and i've tried to emulate but very poorly sadly but she shows this kind of idea of you start off at the bottom of the mountain and you're working your way up and it's your four stages of teacher confidence in the use of technology but fundamentally, you start in survival mode. You know, you imagine you strange school, walking in the door, being handed a cart with 30 Chromebooks in it and told the kids to start them up and off you go. Your natural persuasion is going to be, will they all start? How long will it take? Will they get on task? Will I get them to the right point? And that comes from fundamentally, the only way you build confidence from that survival mode is to start to use something and ultimately master it. So you move to stage two mastery. So in terms of what can we do, well, the first thing is good CPD that kicks off people's ability to get into the technology of choice, whether it's a physical device, whether it's a particular application, a different curriculum resource, whatever it may be, providing an opportunity for people to play with it. We play with things, we learn by finding what we do when we click things, what works, what doesn't work, we build confidence. Once you've got that mastery, you start to weave it and use it more frequently in your lessons. And like most things in life, if you use them regularly, you build muscle memory, you build confidence, and you get confidence that when things go wrong, you can adapt accordingly. After that, the next thing is you start to see a difference in the children's behavior, their retention, their engagement, whatever it may be, and we start to measure impact. Actually, you know, I'm using this, and I've got children who are really focused, and they really engage with this, and they're loving these resources, or whatever it may be. So we get the impact. And then the final stage is, of course, what everybody strives for, which is innovation i had this great idea if i use it this way around and i add something else to it i could get this whole new project or this task for the kids that they're going to really love and we start to innovate in the way that we use things one of the examples i always give in terms of building confidence so one is time starting off with that let's get you going and then build on we can think of the simple things like when we had during lockdown well when we record short exemplars for our students on teams or google meet or whatever it may be why don't we do the same with the products, the quick exemplars of how to get the most out of top tips? Maybe we go a step further and we introduce on a termly basis a little bit like teach meets, teacher stand-ups. Everybody, three minutes, show us the thing that worked best, your top tip for using this application. But you can go, you know, you, you can't go far wrong by taking a view that in your school, however big or small your organisation, you've probably got a phone book that will tell you who's head of which department and who's responsible for different curriculum subjects. But if I said to you, who were the experts on Microsoft Teams? Who were the experts on Edpuzzle or Century or Classroom Cloud or whatever the products are? The answer is probably a lot of people wouldn't know. Well, most humans build based on confidence. And if we were actually playing with something and we knew there were peers we could reach out to and say, can you give me five minutes? Have you got any resources on? Could you show me how to? We're much more inclined to do it than being left in our own time in an evening 
to figure out with some YouTube videos how to do things. So actually fostering that ecosystem of champions of the key digital tools that you use in your school is a great way of fostering that. Who are the flag bearers? Where are the exemplars? Where's the best practice that I can model from and I can see? You know, and all those things are relatively free. Sometimes it's really simple stuff, like we've got some new interactive whiteboards being delivered and there's some training that comes with it. And they're going in three classrooms, so those three teachers have had some training on the new interactive whiteboards. And nobody thought, we've already got some of those from last year. Why didn't we record that training and make it available to other staff who want a refresher or a revisit? It's just changing the way we think about how we use things. And then, of course, there's the other bit, which is, why would we assume that our children would be okay with the new technology we introduce? Sometimes we think, well, you know, that term that often gets banded around, they're digital natives. They've been brought up with technology. Well, just because a child can use the technology that's in their hand or the tablet in place doesn't mean they can use the tools that we choose to use in our school effectively and with purpose. And so actually building the training in to support them is an, another one. And often what we see is schools will start off and we might come on to the sort of, as I refer to, the pillars of a digital strategy. But alongside delivering innovation in teaching and learning, it's developing both teachers and students' digital skills. And you've, you've got to start somewhere along the way, Barry, by saying, I need to actually ask staff, what are they comfortable with? What are they not comfortable with? Not as some kind of scoring system or pat on the back, but just to say, look, it doesn't matter where you are on the scale, but let's see where there are common areas we can support and raise skills. Let's arrange CPD based around that feedback. And then let's do another litmus to check a term, two terms later, and see whether confidence levels are built. Same with our learners. And maybe if we're recording some exemplars or some training videos for our younger learners, we might also share that with parents. We might arrange something so that they're, they're confident with the basics so that they can actually engage and support the younger learners in their work and study that they're doing at home as well. That's brilliant. Uh, and uh, it seems to me it all comes back again to using your superpower which is the relationships and the people's uh, the people within the organization and the teachers and, and the parents and, and bringing them together for uh, for that common purpose and i suppose you're using kind of what you do as a teacher to to uh, generally but you with a specific focus on on um you know capturing and mastering a new way of of delivering you know education it's, it's a funny one, isn't it? We talk about technology and who would have thought it that the real lever to the success or failure of technology is the human being, <laughs> you know, gasp, shock, horror, you know, more often than not, we've seen around the world for, for decades now, the introduction of huge technology projects, whether it's in big school districts in the US, individual schools around the world, where the success or failure has often come to people not understanding why we're doing it not being given sufficient time and capacity to build confidence in using it or not having a clear plan of how that technology is actually going to weave into teaching and learning. The thing that I always put as a big asterisk is we talk about educational technology and our minds are naturally drawn to we're in the classroom, right? It's curriculum resources. It's the devices in the hands of the children and the teacher. It's the interactive whiteboard, the visualizer, whatever it may be. Actually, if we look across the whole ecosystem of a modern school, particularly larger schools that are often linked to a parent and other um, structures, the bulk of the technology used in education is not in the classroom. It is all the systems that allow a school to function effectively. Mm. It can be the simple things like the access control and the digital signage in the school or even the cashless catering. But there's all the big stuff, you know, the, the, the MIS systems, the finance systems, the how we report concerns and track you know, safeguarding risks around children. There's lots of stuff that sits outside. And often our natural kind of persuasion is to think of everything in isolation. Let's review this product. Let's review this solution. Let's consider this in separation. Actually, the big gains by having a digital strategy is making sure that we think about how these things are all interconnected. You know, it's a kind of a given that we don't want to enter our student data at the start of the year in five different systems. We want them to be interconnected or pull through from a central point. If a child comes off roll mid-year and two children join, and in some of our schools in the UK, there's, there's multiples per week coming and going from our student role. We don't want to manually manage that. So that idea of what often gets referred to as rostering is pretty key. But then also it's like, well, after capturing all this data from all these tools, are they coming back to our MIS? Are we able to use the data for purpose? 
you are, I know being very well connected in this in the space like myself will see that much of the conversation at the moment is around AI and often generative AI look at the stuff we can make and create and shape and that's great there's a place for that particularly when it comes to time savings for staff at the moment but actually within our schools much of the focus is on non-generative AI it's how can we look at all the data we've captured from formative and summative assessments of our learners um, and how can we use the AI to spot the gaps, where, how it can save teachers time to focus in on where they need to revisit, um, how we can use the applications that support our personalized learning pathways. So it can identify when a child can, can be stretched in their knowledge or need to be taken back a few steps to rebuild some foundational skills or confidence in, in the subject that they're, 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 they're learning. And so we often have to find this yin and the yang between the things that are being talked about in terms of the, the big picture, the blue sky, the opportunities for the future, with also recognizing that part of our digital strategy is about the here and now. How can we optimize the way we do things now to unlock that most valuable commodity, which is time? Uh, absolutely. I, it's um, uh, earlier you 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 referenced something that I wanted to get onto, and it was uh, the pillars of a digital strategy. Um, yeah. I don't know how far I, I think kind of you know, having had a conversation before, I think this is probably something that would take several days to go into in, in, in proper detail. But could you kind of outline how how you see that structure? Um, mm. Because you, we've, you've already talked about something that's quite close to my heart in a really boring way, which is the nuts and bolts. You know, uh, I remember uh, when you know, designing schools, the first thing in my mind is always where's the storage going to go? Um, and it's that the little things that allow the rest of the school to function. I mean, for, is that one of the pillars? Well, I mean, the truth of it is you may have different pillars in your school, depending on where you are on your existing digital journey. Um, what I tried to do was having worked with so many different entities around the world was look for the commonalities and, and provide a bit of a framework of why don't you start here and then see how it develops. Probably the biggest question is, you know, in many schools, depending on their structures, there will be someone who's the digital lead. Um, the first honest clarification is there's no one person that's an expert on every strand within a digital strategy when we think of all the different topics we're covering. So pillars also provide an idea, and we can call them what we will, provide an opportunity for different people to lead on different strands of our digital strategy. That not only makes sure we've got better co-production, but it also means that people with the right experience and skill set can leave on each strand. Now, if I talk about the typical pillars of a digital strategy, what a couple we've already touched on. So number one, introduction of technology to help innovate learning. Well, not much point adding technology if it's not going to innovate and have some kind of impact on teaching and learning. That's kind of, to me, seems fairly obvious. But... What do we want to innovate? Where are the areas where we're struggling? Is it on student engagement? Is it about building students' digital skills? There's lots of different ways we might look at it. Then we've got the two human factors. How do we develop students' digital skills? You know, if we think back, particularly when we think of secondary provision for our learners, well, the workplace has hugely changed. Seismic shift the last few years. Those things we referred to as soft skills are now the hard skills. They're the things that our employers are looking for. So we have to develop our students' digital skills, and we have to make sure that, one, they're able to utilize the tools and resources we provide within the teaching environment so that they can maximize their potential. But, two, we also need to give them and broaden, develop their digital citizenship, their digital skills, so that they're equipped for the workplace. And in parallel, teacher skills. Now, most teachers going through the teacher qualification route do not get much time to focus on developing their digital skills. They arrive in the school, and often we think, well, we've had all this CPD the last year for our existing staff. This new teacher's arrived, and they're just going to have to pick it up and run with it, aren't they? Well, there's a big area there where we can develop both existing and new staff's digital skills. Um, ironically, sometimes the newest member of staff who's joining from another school might have a gold mine of ideas that they've already been using in their previous school that we want to make sure we tap into. Do we even ask the question, what's your opinion? What worked well for you in your school? How could we weave that into what we're doing? Often the conversation never happens. Then we've got the biggie, which is technology and infrastructure. No point us thinking about what we want to do to enhance any of the ways that digital are within our school's ecosystem if we aren't thinking about what we've already got, the foundations, the infrastructure that makes our school or cluster of schools 
operate. Now, some of that might be about the fundamentals, the networking, the connectivity, the Wi-Fi access points, the, the amounts of devices, the kind of slightly boring stuff, the storage if we're cloud or server in, the, in, in a local setting. But there's also the broader one, which is perhaps our school district entity has plans for expansion. Well, making the right choices with our technology and infrastructure can fundamentally dictate whether we can shape quickly and expand to accommodate a new school joining our organization or whether it's going to be a hugely painful process, whether it can flex to accommodate another bit of disruption in our learning where our children go from being on site to hybrid or at home. Have we got the right technology that will flex? Then we've got one that um, has resonated from earlier in our conversation, which is how can technology um, facilitate, enable, and develop effective communication? Well, um, we have a cluster of schools um, that, for my trust that I lead um, here in Peterborough, and um, we have experts in, in geography, science, history in each of the schools. But actually, up until the pandemic, they weren't talking that heavily together. Suddenly, we created channels where the specialists in one topic across all the schools in the trust could share resources, ideas, best practice. But we also need to think about, well, how can we use that technology to allow better engagement between the teachers and the learners? Maybe we can close the feedback loop by providing audio notes and snippets. Maybe that will support with our children whose parents have English as an additional language. And that's a different way of making it more accessible. Maybe we want to think of communication in the broader sense of how do we actually communicate to parents more effectively so they can get involved in the child's learning journey. And then the last pillar that I always think needs to be on the list, never more than now, frankly, is well-being. Why, how do we use technology, digital, to support well-being? Now, well-being is a term that we can flex and stretch. We can think of it in the obvious sense of, well, it can be a really useful tool to support our SEND learners, much more structured, keep connectivity with them, allow them to have regular meetings with familiar faces and structure. It can be about how we can save teachers time by using tools that help them in some of the preparation work. Maybe that's linked to generative AI and other resources. Maybe it's just about rubrics and automating some of the marketing or data analysis that needs to be done for them. But one of our biggest risks right now, we, we have our risk register in our schools, you know, actually is teacher recruitment and retention. Well, retentions fundamentally is about people feeling like they actually are able to do the thing that they signed up to do, not spending all their time fighting against the, the paperwork, the processes, the systems. So the more that technology can work to support a teacher, free up their time to do what they're best at, that human interaction, then it's got to be a good thing. And part of that is about fostering being part of a community. The two things that tend to be most valued by employees in any entity one is feeling valued, and that often is interpreted by being trusted, a sense of autonomy to do what you do best, and people trust you to get on and do it. And the second is being part of a community. Well, you know, there are teachers in departments in some of our schools that can start the day, be in school, and, and never leave their department area till the end of the day. And that sense of community can be really quite anecdotal rather than actual. Um and yet technology is a way of bridging that gap where you have peers you can reach out to in the same way as all technology, you know, whether it's social media that's used for teacher and educator groups as a place where we can share ideas, the successes and the failures and be more effective. Or when we look at CPD, instead of walking up the corridor and asking Fred, we go online and listen to Barry on his podcast and we get some best practice and ideas. We consume information in lots of different ways. And my well-being might be better by being able to listen to something in my headset, walking home or cycling home or driving home over having to go away and read something. So I think that combination of thinking about all those strands. Now, clearly, someone who's an expert on technology and infrastructure perhaps won't be an expert on well-being, which is why having pillars allows different staff to be part of the conversation. I, it seems to me what you're what you're describing is is a, a kind of a function of the school, which which has to be there, which is a is something that it seeks to kind of help us do what we're doing it's uh and but in terms of digital strategy or thinking about digital world or thinking about new resources we actually have to think about ourselves first thinking about our processes as as teachers as managers i think there's there's a number as there administrators it, yeah there's, there's a number of strands that you're absolutely right i mean what what is the purpose of introducing 
and some naturally sometimes it comes with the cost technology into our schools well it has to be about making us more efficient making us more productive in what we do and efficiency is about ultimately about saving time but in school it's never a case of let's save time so we can all go home early it's save us time so we can do the really important human interactions that we value most the efficiency side all the things we try and do are about recognizing that the biggest value in any organization is the people the workforce we have an obligation to put our workforce first all of our schools, the thing I love about education is that sense of care and nurture that sits around those vision and values for every educational organization. And the fact that it's okay to fail. In fact, in many ways, you know, in many industries, trying something and failing is a bit of a, a red mark against your career progression. You're not going to get promoted if you keep trying stuff and failing. But actually, the stepping stones to innovation and success require you to try stuff and not be scared of failing. And therefore, I think it's incumbent on leadership within reason. Of course, you know, taking risks is, is a proportionate. We're not taking risks with children's safety and other aspects, but actually introducing technology to try different ways of delivering stimulating learning or to try and find different ways for children to engage. I think it's really important. What it does lead on to is, is for the very right reasons, the last few years, um, a mindset around evidence-informed ed tech. In other words, there are so many choices, there are so many products, and budgets are so precious. What we can't afford to do in our enthusiasm to look for technology that will enhance the, the, the um, education setting is, is just buy the one with the best brochure or the shiniest one or the price that looks most attractive. We've got to really think hard about how do we evidence the benefits of that product? What kind of rubric might we follow when we're evaluating and selecting technology so we can mitigate the chance that the shiny thing that we thought we were buying really isn't fit for purpose? And that, if you like, is moving along your, your digital strategy journey, coming up with what we want to try and achieve, why we're going to do it, building the strategy about how we can support those different strands within our school. And then when we identify our priorities, we go out and we look for the right products. And there's lots of places we could look for a steer on that. And that's then the next step of the digital strategy, because once we've chosen those products, we'll move to the phase of how do we evidence their impact. Well, that, that's that's the bit that for me I always start to worry about is is the because as a historian there's a there's a big issue about the selecting of sources. Which yeah. ones do you look for? Which which books do you read? Which which person do you believe? Do you go to Suetonius or do you go to Arian? Do you go to um, you know this book or that book? In in terms of of the uh, the actual technologies, is there a process? Is there a is there a knack? Is there a trick? Is there a a good way to think about the selection of the right things to to bring on board? Whatever your challenge may be, be it academic, be it structural, be it administrative. I think there is um, something I often share is a bit of a rubric and a bit of a flow chart. I mean, the first thing is to to be clear on what kind of what we mean by evidence. So there can be the anecdotal evidence. Barry at his school's using product X and it works really well for them. There's kind of more of the descriptive evidence where we start looking at white papers and this school implemented this product last year and this is what happened. Then there's the correlational evidence, the, the <coughs> idea that um, we have two classes. One class evaluated a product for six months or for a term or for a, a month, and we could see some difference in their engagement levels. And then there might be some sort of causal evidence where we're looking at independent research that's linked to a curriculum product. But fundamentally, I believe you have to separate the two halves. There's the technology assessment and there's the curriculum assessment or the pedagogy assessment. And if you separate those two strands, so we're thinking about this product, but before we invest time in installing it and trialing it, let's think about some key stakeholder questions. So from a curriculum point of view, we might kind of start off by simply saying something along the lines of, does this product we're looking to acquire actually align with our current curriculum? Are we clear? Have we done any kind of summary of what it is we're trying to get out of this product? Have we checked we haven't already got something that does something similar? Because then we can compare and contrast, but maybe there's some saving to be made from that. And are we actually really clear about what this product's instructional purpose or its functional purpose is? We're really clear on it, on how it's intended to be used. In parallel, we can have a conversation of, do we know if this technology will actually work effectively on our current and possibly future devices. So maybe we're saying, 
well, the uh, the historians want this product, but it only runs on iOS. So if we have plans in the future to have some of our students on Chromebooks or Windows, there's a problem. Thinking ahead like that might seem trivial, but actually is really important. Does it work with our current infrastructure? Does it require a two terabyte internet connection to download real-time imagery? I've exaggerated for effect, but the, you know we need to consider it. There's plenty of schools that have spent all their budget having a load of new devices delivered and then realized that the Wi-Fi infrastructure doesn't have the capacity to support them all. Um, are we happy with it from a privacy policy perspective? What data does it capture? Where does it store it? Who has access and for how long? You know, if we're buying a new tool and the, the historians really want it, but we find that its data center and servers are hosted in Moscow, maybe for some that'd be a problem. Now, it may be a different consideration if you're in Moscow. They might say if it's hosted in the UK or the US, there's a problem. But we have to be mindful of whatever the different requirements are in each country that we're, we're, we're um, resident. And then there's a the bit we talked about earlier, which is, does it actually integrate? Does it roster with our existing systems? Or are we going to be reinventing the wheel every time we run it? If we've covered those basic bits and we say, you know what, it's a yes to all of it, it ticks all the boxes, now we can invest some time in actually evaluating it, building the confidence. And I suppose when you want to build confidence, you kind of ask yourself a few different kinds of questions. So you might start with, have we all got down around the table as a team who are looking for it and actually vetted it, had, had an evaluation of what it's supposed to do? Has a vendor done us a presentation so we're clear on its full breadth of capabilities? Um, have we actually evaluated and trialed it in the classroom? And if we haven't, let's get a trial version to make sure it works on our devices. Because, you know, sometimes technology looks great when you see it as an example or as a YouTube video, but then when it's implemented, it doesn't perform as quickly or as effectively as you might have imagined. Um, and then we might also say at the end of that, have we come up with some kind of questionnaire so we can capture feedback from the staff that have used it about whether it met their expectations, whether it exceeded them, or whether there were any obvious sticking points that would make it not suitable. At any point in there, there's nothing wrong with going back to a vendor and saying, look, you gave me a 30-day trial, but I need to extend it. I need to have more time to build confidence. And a good vendor should say, no problem. If not, then you're feeling you're under pressure to make a decision. And who wants to make a decision if you don't feel you've had the full opportunity to evaluate it? Get to the end of that journey, and you're happy, then you've got a collective number of voices who've been involved in evaluating it from both the pedagogy and from the technical perspective, and you're in a much stronger position to then make a recommendation to your leadership team to purchase it, in parallel to getting those bits of evidence. What other schools do we know across our region that also use that product? What's their feedback been? What's the support been like? I always argue that schools should be looking at co-production externally as well as internally. So rather than a transaction with a vendor, start a relationship. If you start a good relationship, not only should that vendor be supporting you with the CPD, the initial training and getting everyone comfortable using it, but you can create a feedback loop where you can be saying, you know what would be great in your next update? If you could just make this button do this or this feature add this option, that would make our lives a lot easier. The vendor should listen because it makes their product better. And that co-production becomes the evolution of each iteration and each release of the product. I mean, this this sounds, I mean, very much in the way you know, I try to see schools, which is that collection of relationships and then building that relationships from within the school, students, teachers, you know, families into the stakeholders that come from without. So, you know, vendors, uh, technological providers, uh, the wider stakeholders that you have in the school, you know, you're maybe a parent company, maybe you're part of a group, maybe you're connected to a local university, you know, whatever it may be. And then building that confidence, which, which you've already talked about by bringing people on board at the early stage, trialing, developing and then creating a, you know a relationship with technology almost as as that that kind of that that uh, part of the silk the you know, the spider's web that brings all of those different elements in the in the in the college together what's the what's the final part you mentioned or referenced vaguely the final part of the journey once we talked about selection what comes to the end of that journey is that is that when we start talking about you know you're not well i suppose kpis is a is a phrase everyone loves but you know how you work out if this is actually making a difference yeah we, you, i mean you're absolutely right it is about measuring impact i think the bit that i just kind of alluded to um earlier on in our conversation is we're somewhat pre-programmed in education that when we measure the impact of technology that we are very much zeroing in on children's attainment and progress 
has that made it somehow better? Now, that's not a bad starting for 10 to be, think about, albeit we've got to be realistic that sometimes technology isn't about making a shift in three months. It's, it's a much bigger picture than that. But if we start to think in more broader terms, that sometimes the technology is about um, improving outcomes and attainment. Sometimes it's about improving time and allocating more time to other more purposeful tasks. Sometimes it's about improving well-being. Sometimes it's got a long-term link to retention of our staff because we're putting the right technology in their hands and the right tools to save them time. Um, sometimes we can think away from the traditional inspection framework of, do our kids have a love of learning? Now, experiential resources with technology are great, and we can think about discussions around AR, VR, or the broader XR conversation and the metaverse. Um, and that can be great. We can have learners that have never been to a museum or never been to the Amazon rainforest that suddenly can experience those things. But of course, they can't just be there because they're cool and they're novelty factor. They've got to be woven into, are they purposeful in the curriculum? So we have to find a kind of a balance that says, well, actually, we've got some of our learners who wouldn't previously have engaged at this stage, but now they are. Maybe from a, an accessibility and ascend perspective, We've got learners who've transitioned from primary to secondary phase that, you know, just weren't quite ready for a traditional secondary setting, weren't quite ready to enter the world of Shakespeare in their first year uh, of English language. But we've got them on Minecraft creating 3D models of the Globe Theatre, and we're starting to talk about the concepts. We find different ways where technologies based on age and stage can find and support different pathways to get our learners on the journey and enjoying it. Maybe we can talk about the fact that actually our parents have a different perception of our school because they get much more information. They're included more in activities the children are doing. They feel that they can actually access different resources in, in a different way. Um, and depending on the kind of school you are, you know, that perception, that engagement with parents can be a really important link to whether their child is at your school and stays at your school and whether new parents want to, based on reputation, come to your school. Um, and it's easy to think, well, it's the shiny, shiny again, isn't it? Parents will go to the school that's got the most cutting edge technology that's there. But actually, you know what? If parents will come to a school that's got other parents talking about how the technology is used for purpose and how their child loves the experiences or is stimulated more broadly. So I think we can be a bit more nuanced than that. And to be fair, most good school leaders get that and are ahead of the curve already. I think I think that's something that's quite close to my heart. Is um, I I I really hate kind of when we're we're using things simply as a as a one off. So you know, be it VR, be it a piece of technology, be it a facility, and it has to be has to be woven into into that experience, and it has to be woven into the an opportunity to, as you rightly say, yeah. You know, there's one metric that we start with, which is okay, the attainment, but actually there's so many others that are quite difficult to measure. You know, yep. the 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 attitude of the students to learning, yeah, you know, their well being, the teacher well being, the 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 way the students start seeing themselves, they start seeing their education, start seeing the 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 idea of school uh, as a whole and education as a whole. I've had I mean, pushback on that measure from the senior leaders at times in schools, and I've always flipped it the other way and said, "Do you think the league tables that show your data of the school is a fair and full measure of your school?" <laughs> well, of course not. We're a lovely, vibrant school with great visions and values, and our children are resilient and well-rounded, and so on. And it's like, so if those are things that you hold dear. Why wouldn't you be looking to measure the things that actually create and maintain those strands within your school? Absolutely. I mean, we, we're coming to kind of 45 minutes and and I wanted to use the last kind of couple of minutes to to get just a couple of kind of things from you. I mean, it's not a quick fire round. Don't worry, no panic. But <laughs> but for, from your perspective, if there's if you have school leaders or people interested in tech um, and and getting more technology into the classroom, what's the what would you want to say to them? What would you want them to take away from this conversation we've had? If you're building a digital strategy, you want to start the conversation. And just as another little reminder here, sometimes our senior leaders that initiate planning a strategy and new project in a school have to acknowledge without judgment that there are some topics and technology in a classroom might be one that they aren't the most experienced at. They don't have the reference point themselves. Absolutely. I've got many leaders of big school groups that haven't been practitioners physically on a day-to-day -day basis for some years. 
and the technology has only been around a few years. So it's no surprise that they don't have that reference point. So the big measures are be bold, get other people who are down the food chain but have the experience involved, get as many people involved in the co-production. Don't try and be too bold and get and do too much too quickly. Less is more and less is chocolate. Focus on a few things, do them well, get them embedded, build confidence and go again. Plan for lots of CPD and whatever you've planned, double it. Think of innovative and creative ways that staff can continue to share their experiences. How does Barry, who discovered this great resource online at the weekend and is now using it, how do we make sure that Barry can find an easy way to share that with other leaders rather than waiting for them to reach out to him? Think of confidence as being the key to the success or failure of your digital journey. Think, as we've discussed, much broader in terms of ways to measure impact and um, communication is the key. As long as people understand where we're at, what we're doing, why we're doing it, and how we're going to measure it, and then people are much more likely as a group and the stakeholders within your school to be part of the journey together. And my last one that I always share when I'm chatting, particularly on a podcast or any other platform, is grow your own community connections. Each and every person in, in the school, think about the newsletters you can sign up to, the social media accounts of people who are good practitioners that you could follow, the podcasts that you can listen to and discover new episodes each week, the events in your region that maybe you could try and find ways to engage with. I know time is that precious commodity, but there's different ways we can consume information when the time allows, that allow us to broaden our, our horizons. And of course, by understanding more and seeing more of what's available, what's out there, what people are doing, without realizing it, we're also building a bit more confidence. We're removing the fear of the unknown. And, and the more we understand what others are doing, the more inclined we are to give it a try ourselves. That's wonderful advice. Thank you so much, Al Kingsley, for, for being with us this evening. Um, the uh, the podcast is brought to us, uh, the sponsorship from TIC. Uh, so TIC uh, are a fantastic organization. If So if you are looking to make a change, you're thinking of going overseas as a teacher, or if you are a, a school principal and are looking for uh, recruitment in the coming months, then do get in touch with TIC and, and, uh, and, and see what they can offer. Al Kingsley, thank you so much for being on, on the podcast this evening. I have taken copious notes um, and I'm going to be having a chat to a few of uh, kind of the digital uh, warriors uh, at uh, the Global College uh, next week. Uh, we're on a we're on a, a long weekend this weekend uh, with uh, and we've really got some amazing kind of colleagues who are leading the way with with some of this. But I think you've given me food for thought about how we can really kind of make a, a much better go of this. So thank you so much and uh, and Absolute hopefully pleasure. We'll, we'll see you again. My, it's definitely my pleasure. And more importantly, I think as we all like to say, if in doubt, reach out. I will always happily share resources that I have, put people in contact with somebody that's doing something similar. So always feel free to connect. So yeah, Al is on LinkedIn and posts regularly. So I've I've read a few. So um, and it's always great to to see that stuff. So um, I'll see you at a conference somewhere near you. Um, thank you so much and uh, good evening. Bye bye.